Today it's, it's bits and pieces of a couple of talks because I'm working on uh, expanding them into something and it was actually a very interesting exercise putting them together. The second half of this talk uh, is based on material that I did uh, for the DH conference in Utrecht this summer, and it was really interesting returning to it after a grant that we just submitted uh, to SHRP, the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, actually on the, the topic of that talk, but to see how much had changed in my understanding of what we, what we were doing. And so, <coughs> even if you've seen them, uh, even if you've seen, I don't think anybody could have seen both, but even if you've seen the one in Digital Humanities, uh, it, it was actually quite interesting to see what had changed on this. So this appetizing title, Small, Thick, and Slow, is uh, all about the wonders of humanities data. Uh, if that doesn't entice you to go into the humanities, I don't think anything will. Um, and I want to talk then about actually how humanities data works, how we aren't supporting it uh, with current data infrastructure, and how, um, uh, what our proposal actually that we just submitted for funding uh, is to, to improve that a little bit. A couple of notes, I switch back and forth between data and data, just randomly. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm never 100% clear in my own head if it's a collective noun or a plural noun, and so I bounce back and forth that way too. So sometimes, I, sometimes it's deliberate, I mean it as a concept, other times it's just whatever happened. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the nature of data in the humanities uh, and its implications for uh, infrastructure design. I should also say this is going to be text heavier than normal on my slides, uh, partially because just like uh, I've forgotten who said it, but I didn't have time to be concise. Uh, I'm still working this out, and so it's actually quite hard, at least I find, to reduce everything to a pithy drawing if I'm still not 100% sure where I'm going with it yet. Um, but at any rate, uh, I'm going to talk then about what humanities data is, I think, uh, how the infrastructure currently interacts with it, um, why human humanities researchers have been slow to adopt that infrastructure, um, and how we can do it, uh, how we can improve the infrastructure to make it easier to work with. And um, I'm going to be keep coming back to this idea about what humanities data is, and I'm going to keep coming back to the idea that it's small, and that is to say that it's focused on a small number of data points, or even a single data point. Even big data in the humanities is small compared to you know, other fields, but I do think there's a difference between small data and big data. You can do big data on a small amount of things, uh, but when I say humanities data is small, I actually mean it in a slightly different way. It's qualitatively a different kind of thing. It's thick, and that means that it is subject to incredibly intense curation in the small data approach. Uh, and it's slow, by which I mean that an individual data point can be reused, revisited, re-argued, even whether something is data could be argued back and forth for years, and I'll, I'll mention it later, but the example to keep in mind is Jane Austen studies. Five data points, 200 years of research. So I'm going to talk in two parts about it. The first is I'm going to talk about the nature of humanities data, and then the second is to show a possible solution that we're working on. Uh, this is actually for Cameron because some of the, some of my data stuff he disagree. I can't figure out why, so I'm just actually doubling down. Um, but, but in the meantime, I'm going to qualify just a little bit uh, and say, so I'm going to be dealing in generalities. I'm going to be talking about what humanities do rather than what you know I do on my specific projects. Uh, and so not all data is going to, in the humanities is going to be small or representational, which is really the kind of data that I'm talking about. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a bit. Not all humanities work is about thick description, although, to be honest, an awful lot of it is. And not all humanities work is about reworking established or existing material, but again, an awful lot of it is. Um, but these are certainly true of a lot of humanities data, and that's actually what I'm going to be talking about as we go. So you also should know something about me, because A, I'm a humanist and you always do this, uh, and B, because in fact who I am dictates my own understanding of what it is we do in scholarship and my background as well. So I'm a traditionally trained Germanic philologist. 
my, my training was at the University of Toronto in the School of Medieval Studies, the Center for Medieval Studies there, which is about as old-fashioned and, and conservative a place as you can get uh, for this. I then went to Yale, where I studied under Fred Robinson, who's also a very, very sort of classically trained, old-fashioned uh, Germanic philologist. Um, and that means that, but I've always worked digitally, so my dissertation was a database of scribal variants in Anglo-Saxon uh, in Anglo -Saxon England. Uh, it was, uh, we put together a database on it and then I did an analysis of that database. So it was actually a kind of big data humanities project of Alma Lettre. We actually debated handing in the database, but that had never been done at Yale, so we decided to write it out instead. Um, and then later in 2005, I did a 100,000 word digital edition of Cadman's Hymn. Uh, Cadman's Hymn is a nine line poem. So that's, I would say, almost the definition of small data humanities work in a digital format. Uh, and now what I'm working on is a five object edition of a number of um, various kinds of objects from pre-conquest England. The Ruthwell Cross, uh, we'll talk about it later, the Ruthwell Cross, which is a stone cross, the Bewcastle Cross, uh, uh, Brussels Cross, and a couple of the manuscript poems. So the important thing to know about all this is I am definitely coming at this from a textual linguistic um, literary background. <coughs> this, and so that's when I think of data, that's what I'm thinking of. And my focus has been textual criticism uh, and textual data, although I'm now working with 3D and 2D stuff. Which again means that my bias is towards representational data rather than other things, linguistic data, let's say, or archaeological data. So, the problem of humanities data. Um, one of the interesting things about data in the humanities is humanists generally don't like talking about data. Um, you will find uh, a number of, if you type in humanities and data, the articles that will come up top are literature is not data, your work is not data, data will not save you. Uh, as a rule, humanists are actually quite <coughs> nervous about talking about their work as data. And that's because uh, uh, there are some good reasons for this, but the way they have traditionally talked about what we would call data is in, ter in, stern in terms of almost use cases. So one of the things that we might consider data is primary sources. Um, so that means the texts and the artifacts, the objects of study. Uh, they could be original, so it could be, you know, uh, uh, the, if we're interested in this table, it could be this table itself. Or it could be mediated in some way, that's what I actually do as a textual critic, which means somebody might have captured it in some way and represented it to you, but it's still your work as a humanist, you still treat that as your primary source, even though it's being mediated by somebody else. Uh, you understand that as the thing you're studying, and that's as opposed to secondary sources, which are really the things that you study with. And so those are the work of other people, they are uh, ex explanatory, the people you disagree with, the people you rely on. There's obviously a third kind, tertiary, which is when you start getting into encyclopedias. Uh, and then quadrary, which is when people start ripping off the Wikipedia and putting it on their own website. Uh, and I don't know if you can go about that, but nevertheless. And they also tend to deal with readings. And readings are, can be one of two different things. Readings can be the passages, uh, the extracts or the quotations that are used for uh, interpretation or support. And readings can also be the interpretation, the end product of the research itself. A lot of this, actually, you, an easy way of understanding this in some ways is to think about a sermon, uh, because in some ways that is the original humanities research work. And if you think about how a sermon works, you have a primary source, which in a Christian context would be a Bible. Uh, you have secondary sources, which would be other people that are interpreting the book or whatever is happening. Uh, the religious person who's giving the sermon then both talks about readings, that is to say the passages that they're going to be ex uh, explicating in the sermon, um, and they provide a reading, which is they tell you how to understand the book. And so that's how that system works uh, with us. Another important thing about humanities data is that it's highly contingent. Um, and so you can have things that are a primary source in one context and a secondary source in another context. Quite often it's actually the other way around. You start as a secondary source and become a primary source. Um, all of us should hope that this happens to us. Um, you want your work to ultimately be the thing other people study. So when I write an article you know, about 
I don't know, this project, you have become a primary source when people are writing about Dan's thought about data, not arguing with me about what data means. So you can have a secondary, a secondary source can become a primary source. Primary sources can be secondary as well, which is, uh, you. well, the most common example is in fact an edition of something. I go and do an edition of Shakespeare that is a secondary source in some ways. I've dealt with it, I have arguments about it that you can then disagree with, but it's also a primary source in that not many people are gonna go and reconstruct Hamlet uh, in order to do secondary research. They're gonna use me as their primary source. And they can also be hard to constrain, and I love this quote from Christine Borgman, that almost any document, physical artifact or record of human activity can be used to study culture and arguments proposing previously unrecognized sources, such as high school yearbooks, cookbooks, or even wear patterns on the floor, are valued as active scholarship. So the other thing that happens in the humanities is whether or not something is data is actually often a debate. You will throw something out there and say this is a data set or a data point, and somebody else will argue back that it isn't. A really interesting example of that that probably some people will know is, for example, are there really three versions of Hamlet or not? And what does it mean to say that there were three versions of Hamlet? Uh, that's an example of a data fight that you could have in the humanities. <coughs> so how does data work in other fields? Again, I'm gonna generalize a lot, but I'm now talking about a different way of understanding data, and that is that this resistance makes sense in our case uh, because what we do is actually quite different from what people do in other fields, just in terms of our work. So in other fields, and again, I'm obviously generalizing, and in fact, as I always like to say, evolutionary psychology is really in the humanities, so it's always the exception to this. Um, but nevertheless, what you have is you have what you might better call a capta, and that is to say the data that you work with is what you've managed to extract from the real world object that you're looking at. Uh, you do it by throwing memes at it if you work at CERN. Uh, you do it by watching it if you're a biologist, perhaps. You do it uh, by counting or weighing, but the data is what comes off of what you've actually extracted for true observation from that object. It's generated through experiment, observation, measurement, and, and then you make your analysis of it. I should say analysis there. And then you make your analysis of it. And so I always find it's really useful to explain this in terms of Darwin. When Darwin goes to the Galapagos Islands and he watches the finches, what is his data? Is it the finches? Or is it his notes about the finches? And the answer is that it's the notes about the finches. That's the thing that he's now going to analyze. It's not the finches themselves. The data is the stuff that he's observing about the finches. It's the representation of information in a formalized manner. It's the facts, numbers, letters, and symbols that describe an object, an idea, a condition, a situation, or other factors. In the humanities, though, uh, we can have both data and CAPTA. We've always been able to do this, although CAPTA is easier to do now than it used to be. But a lot of times, and this is the core thing, it's data. That is to say, it's given to us. It's not something we're extracting. Um, this data, as I've said, is very specific and very prov uh, provisional, and it can depend on interpretation, whether it is data, and we frequently revisit the same data sets, but in our case, we've got a real-world object. So the question is, what would humanities data be? Would it be the finch? Yeah, probably, actually, it's the finch. Sometimes it might be the notes. Uh, we can do data work where we capta stuff out, we take stuff out of it. And one of the fun things about being the humanities is sometimes it's actually about whether or not Darwin thought that the finches were his data or his notes or, you know, why was Darwin doing this in the first place? That, that could be it. But mostly it's the finches. <coughs> and we have some interesting proof of this. So one interesting proof of this is it's really, really hard uh, to scoop somebody in the humanities. So data in the humanities really is, unlike science data, really is practically and theoretically pretty much non rivalrous We can think of one or two examples of this. Um, so, you know, Dead Sea Scrolls is an example where, you know, if, if I release a facsimile of Dead Sea Scrolls before you do, that stops you do, from doing it. But other than that, once it's out there, it, you haven't scooped anybody. 
I remember when I was doing my PhD thesis, uh, this was the advice of my supervisor actually, he told me back in those days, you still had to look it up in print, but I would look up dissertations abstract international, probably about once, I don't know, every quarter, whenever it came out. And then I'd always panic because somebody was doing my thesis. Mm -hmm. And then as he told me, don't worry about it because it's the humanities, <laughs> we'll just change it if it turns out it's true, but it never is the same. And so you would read something and you'd go, oh, they're doing my thesis, and then you'd look, nah, they're not doing my thesis. <laughs> it's very, very hard to scoop somebody in, in this business. Um, and humanities researchers rarely have an incentive or a capability of presenting, preventing others from accessing their data. There is at the very beginning, so you know, even as much as I'm into open data, I still, I gotta say, have my doubts sometimes about putting out the 3D scans I've got of the Rothwell Cross before I've written about them, just because I have the data myself. Uh, but after that initial, you know, premiere on whatever you have, there's not really any reason to stop somebody, you know, from reading Pride and Prejudice, um, because they're not going to do something that, you know, take your idea or anything from it. And as I say, Jane Austen Studies is really the best example of this that I can think of. There's five novels, and they've been doing it for 200 years. And, you know, they fight a lot in Jane Austen Studies, but it's not, you know, not over, nobody's allowed to read Pride and Prejudice, because uh, <laughs> that's mine, I've got it. Now, you might say the digital humanities is going to change this, and it is true uh, that the digital humanities does actually allow us to do CAPTA in a way that previously we weren't able to. Uh, you know, big data style stuff where you're not talking about thick description, but you're looking for lots of examples of something. So we can now have CAPTA, intermediate observations extracted from something. Uh, and we can, for example, work across entire historic and geographic corpora in a way that we, we couldn't necessarily do that in the past. And this also introduces the uh, possibility of doing deductive work, where you have a hypothesis, you run a text mining across a corpus of some kind, and then you, uh, you know, analyze what comes back the other way. And it's certainly the case, as anybody uh, who works in DH knows after working in traditional humanities, uh, that it makes method questions an awful lot more important than they used to be. Um, you know, I always say that, that when you apply computation to a humanities problem, you invariably end up wondering about the economics of the research. It's just, it's astounding how much method and uh, context become a play in the digital humanities. But it's a mistake to see the digital humanities as being the perfection of the humanities. That is to say that the fact that we now can do CAPTA research in a way that we couldn't in the past means that we should be doing this. And there is a, a strain of this. There's a great exchange in 2012. Um, it's not really exchange, it's a bunch of blogs that, um, Stanley Fish wrote a blog arguing that the digital humanities uh, was not for him and it couldn't do close reading. Uh, and then Lieberman, um, in the language files uh, set out to prove him wrong, uh, to prove to prove his reading of Milton wrong. Um, and Lieberman basically argues that he's falsified Fish. And so he's treating this essentially as DH can now prove that interpretations are right or are wrong. For a long time, this actually quite scared me because I was thinking falsification is never a standard we've had to meet in literary studies in the past. But I now realize, uh, the more I've thought about it, that in fact, Lieberman's misunderstanding uh, what, what Fish is doing. He's really making an interpretive point rather than something that could be falsified. Anyway, the point of this is, it's very tempting, and you'll see a lot of rhetoric, less so now than you used to, about how DH is the end point of the humanities. You used to hear, one day there won't be digital humanities, we'll all just be humanities. Uh, but what they meant is everybody will be di doing digital humanities by which they meant big data and CAPTA falsifiable work. But it's not true. Uh, and one of the reasons is because, first of all, big data, or what you might call big CAPTA, is simply not better in every instance than small data work. Uh, for example, what Anne Frank thought she was doing when she wrote the diary of Anne Frank is not something you can answer, it's not a big data question. It's a question that comes from close reading, looking at the different versions, and coming up with an argument that you can't falsify, you can agree with or disagree with, and say is more or less reasonable. But that's not a question that DH can answer in a way by using big data. It, it's still a, a valid small data humanities question. 
Um, and also, not all digital humanities is big capta. Um, although size of data doesn't matter uh, in terms of whether or not you're doing big or small data work, my edition of Kevin's Hymn, that 100,000 word on an online poem thing, um, is definitely small data work. I'm not doing algorithmic comparison across things. I'm using a computer to bring lots of readings together and then doing a description. Um, and big cap approaches to humanities questions can also miss the point, which is if you take somebody who's an experienced paleographer and apply them to a medieval manuscript, um, that kind of thick description, you simply can't capture that uh, by looking at lots of manuscripts. Uh, you can't capture the experience. You can build uh, you know, algorithms to check whether or not the same scribe's doing it or something, but you don't have that paleographic experience that comes. Intensive curation and analysis is still a major function in humanities research and always will be. So why does this matter? Well, the reason why it matters is because humanities research, working slow, thick, and slow, despite, or sorry, small, thick, and slow, despite how attractive that sounds, um, is actually also quite useful in theory for big data work. And the reason is because Traditional humanists produce an immense amount collectively of extremely high quality data. The, you can't get somebody poring over a data point uh, in an oncology trial the way you can in manuscript studies. And so this stuff has been incredibly densely curated. And it's also broadly compatible with each other. Uh, that's also interesting to think about, and that is just because we edited Shakespeare 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 200 years ago, it doesn't mean we're not going to edit Shakespeare again next year. What happens with editing humanities data is people keep redoing it because the context of all the other data points change. And so once you've re-edited uh, you know, Austin or George Eliot, um, then we think differently about literature and somebody thinks, you know what, I've got to go back and re-edit Milton or Shakespeare who are the Beowulf poet. Um, and so it keeps getting updated, this incredibly well curated data. So if we could find a way of capturing both the intensity of the curation and the quality of the data, then we'd have an extremely useful big data set that we could work with. And we'd be maximizing the benefit of all that traditional work that's going into that. Right? Every English department, every German department, every history department is intensely curating small data points. If we could capture that, imagine how good our big data work would be. But the trouble is, humanists are not doing it. Now, they're not doing it for a bunch of reasons. One reason is perhaps they're just ornery. Um, and there's probably something to that, to be honest. Um, but the main reason, I think, is because it's simply not economical. If you are a small data researcher working on a, a division of Cadman's Hymn, for example, it's simply not in my interest to devote any attention. It's hard enough producing an edition of Kevin's Hymn, let alone producing a Kevin's Hymn, and then preparing my data so you can include it in some other large database. So the goal of most small data work is, in fact, to serve as a primary source or as an example in, in some other work, either for themselves or for others. If I'm editing Pride and Prejudice, I'm doing it so you can read Pride and Prejudice, not so somebody else can throw it in a big database, perhaps, of European novels or another database of all fiction or something. And if I'm not doing it for that reason, I'm using it to support extremely specific arguments about that source material. If I'm interested in uh, the American Civil War and the degree to which uh, Britain is or is not helping the South, I might do detailed analysis of shipping registers, but I don't care. And it's not in my interest and I don't have the funding to make all of that work useful for you for some economic history of Western Europe. All I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking about the work I'm going to pull out of this for my study of the American Civil War. The features that require reuse are in essence separate and require an entirely different publication workflow, right? Basically what you want, if you want me to take my shipping register and give it to you so you can do some world economic history, you're asking me to take it out of its context, 
put it in some other place, in a repository somewhere, presumably, standardize the metadata so that it doesn't necessarily just work with my argument anymore, but you know, why do I care about that? And you want to extract it from the interpretive context of information that I just spent the entire five years doing. Right? The, the whole reason that I was editing this thing was to tell you more about the British influence on the American Civil War, and you're asking me, could you please strip that out because I want to do something entirely different with it. So it's not economical, even if I have all the computational skills in the world, which I don't because I don't need them in order to do my American Civil War history, even if I had that, you're asking me essentially to add an extra part onto my project so that you can reuse my data in a way that I wasn't interested in in the first place for. And I can give you an example of this, which is an incredible lost opportunity. It is manuscript photography. Since about the mid-1980s and the second wave, let's say, of the digital humanities, when people started doing digital editions, particularly of medieval and renaissance texts, a standard feature has been photographs, color, high-definition high photo, color photographs of manuscripts. Now, this was crucially important because before that, everything was black and white and whatever you call that newspaper style where they do the little dots. Um, and so it was my, I remember when I was an undergraduate, my dad could not believe as a theoretical physicist that the degree to which he had access to money, he didn't really, I mean, he's a theoretical physicist. He worked with a pencil and paper. He couldn't believe the degree to which he could get funding no problem for his work and people who were working with medieval manuscripts had to work off black and white, you know, again, whatever you call that newspaper style printing of manuscripts when color and definition is like crucial in what they do. So once we got high definition digital photography, everybody started throwing these things out there. There's thousands of manuscript photographs. And almost all of these editions contain these manuscript photographs. And then they have incredibly detailed, research-based, expert-written commentary on those photographs. They tell you where the page is. They'll tell you that the page numbering is wrong, uh, that it actually was this, or that it's currently this page. But if you go back in time, you can figure out that it actually originally was this other page. They'll tell you who the scribes were. They tell you the dating. They can tell you that this bit has been written over. They'll tell you uh, the history. All of these are examples I can think of. They will tell you the history of the page numbering on the page of the manuscript. So for instance, the Beowulf manuscript has been renumbered several times, and I've seen studies of who, which librarians wrote those numbers up in the top corner. So there's an incredible amount of research-based expert commentary on these photographs. They transcribe them. They edit them, which means not only have they transcribed them, but they tell you where the mistakes were made and what it should have read. And they represent, in theory, a potentially gigantic and extremely rich data set for manuscript studies. Because all of these people have been individually pumping out this incredibly curated stuff. You could do automatic scribe identification. You could have training sets. You could do incredible history of the book work. But because these things have been published to support the individual editions rather than cross-manuscript work by big data people, it's basically impossible to do that. You can collect manuscript photographs, that's not a problem. But you can't collect this, this curated manuscript stuff with its curation and know where it came from. And the reason is there's very few standards, there are some recent standards for this, but very few standards for uh, metadata or API use. Nobody puts this stuff in repositories. It's always inside the project itself, which is in essence a unique repository for each project. Very few of them explicitly connect themselves to the expert commentary. They do it by proximity. I'm in the same directory as the comments, so it's got to be on this manuscript photograph. And the relationship to other images and the publication status and everything you would know to know that this is highly curated stuff is not there. So you basically can't do it. And the result is that there's a lost opportunity to create a big cap data set of thickly described data from hundreds of individual small data projects. Now you can do it, and you know, Google works on dealing with data as it is in the world, and I'm sure you could do it like that, but it's not a small project when it could be. So what do we do? And the answer is to accept the traditional nature and use case involved in the production of the data. Uh, to recognize that fair has to work with the small, thick, and slow as 
<laughs> so my children are tall and smart, I should say, by the way. Uh, they have to work with the small, thick, and slow, as well as it does with the fleet, fast, and handsome uh, science data. And so it means that we either have to work within a humanities, traditional humanities workflow, if we're going to capture that uh, small, thick, and slow data, or we have to find some way of making it worth the slow, small, thick, and slow humanness, no matter how attractive they are, <laughs> to work within ours. And so as long as fair data publication means, in essence, publishing separately uh, and publishing this data out of context, publishing it twice, we're never going to be able to reap the benefits of all this work that's going into it. Now, before I talk about our solution, I'm just going to say quickly, we've been here before in a really interesting example, which is the New English Dictionary, which is what used to be called the Oxford English Dictionary. And so it was based, started in the 1840s, I think, late 1840s. Uh, and it is based on historical principles, the first dictionary in the English language based on historical principles. It followed a German dictionary uh, from Zebras uh, based on the same idea. And what that means is they decided that they were going to read everything in English and build their definitions from quotations from these books that they read. And so every definition would be based on examples and they would quote the examples. And if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary today, when they've got the definition, each definition is supported by examples showing that usage. It's a massive, in our terms, crowdsourced big data project. What they did was they got thousands of readers and they set them loose. And then they were, anytime they found a word, they were to write out the word in the context and send in this slip and they collected 1.8 million by the end of the 19th century. Um, and in essence, what they were doing was building a big data project off of a series of small data projects. They were collecting books, which had been put together by scholars and editors and authors, and then they were extracting all the quotations and then building their big data set, which they were then going to do cross uh, collection work. So it's in essence an analog version of what we were trying to do. And they had exactly the same problem, which was as soon as they did it, they realized it wasn't going to work. And the reason why it wasn't going to work was so many of these books were in terrible shape. Uh, especially medieval and renaissance things were often not edited at all, which meant that their readers had to go back to the original manuscripts of the original print and then try to figure out what Chaucer they were supposed to read in order to extract the Chaucer quotes. And what they needed was somebody else to go do that work, do the thick description, say this is what the Canterbury Tales is, so their readers could then extract the words. And so they didn't have modern editions, and the editions that they did have were often poor because the people were putting them together not thinking that the dictionary both, or the New English Dictionary was going to have to read these things. And so they didn't say why they did it. They didn't explain the basis of how they were putting it together. They would be uneven in their spelling. Uh, it was very, very inconsistent. So what they discovered in essence was that they had poor data and the data wasn't in a format that they could use. So what they did was the very same people went out and created textual societies, the Early English Text Society, the Chaucer Society, various clubs in England primarily. And these were platforms for new editions. They created a market by which scholars could go and they encouraged scholars to go research the stuff they needed in a format that worked for them. And so basically what they did was they solved that problem of the double publication. They created calls for papers in essence uh, they encouraged the leading scholars to go do it, but you didn't have to become an expert in dictionary making. They wanted you because you knew something about Chaucer or Milton or you know, uh, Jane Austen or whatever it was. And so it was an incredibly symbiotic relationship. They provided an output for dense, small data work, which by chance, not chance actually, deliberately, worked perfectly for what they were doing their big data work. And the result was an increase in high quality small data editions and a better data set uh, for the NED. And I should stress, they did one other thing with this too. You would imagine, given what they wanted, once they did it and they had the volume and they collected the data, that that would be enough for them. But it's not. Remember, one of the things about humanities data is that it's small and it's thick, but it's slow. That is to say, people re-edit this stuff and they come back and they think about it again. The Early English Text Society doesn't care. They reissue the stuff. They just redo it. It really is a small data series created by big data people so that they could harness the power of the small data people. So we need something like that for the digital age, is my argument. 
And we need a workflow that encourages small data research to prepare their data sets in a way that respects what they want to do, opens up these small, thick, and slow data sets for big data research, but doesn't increase, in fact, if anything, reduces the cost of production, publication, and maintenance. So a workflow in which big cap to research and suitability is inherent in the publication of small data work. But we encourage the people who do small data <coughs> to do small data just in a way that works for us. So how to do it? How can you be fair to the small, thick, and slow? Um, so I'm going to talk about this data-first approach that, first of all, we started taking in the Visionary Cross Project, which is my 2D and 3D uh, project on these crosses from early uh, medieval England. I'm going to talk about some of our parameters, uh, background issues, models, and the implementation, and the further work. And this is a case where when I gave this talk in Utrecht this summer, many of the things here worked. Um, and then they broke because, as I'll get to in a second, CERN and Zenodo didn't realize the way that they were supporting small data work because it wasn't designed for this. And what we're actually doing now is we've got a project we've just submitted to work with CERN to canonize some of the features that they didn't realize were supporting small data work. I'm going to go very quickly through this project, but it's a, a nine-year-old project, I think, in terms of its funding anyway to produce an edition and an archive of a number of early medieval English things. Um, by edition, I mean scholarly mediated reproduction. I've got facsimiles in 3D and 2D. By archive, I mean it's gonna be a data set of these facsimiles. And by cultural matrix, we're arguing, as part of our thick part of this, that these all belong together for a reason. Uh, and that's why we're editing all of them. So we're also editing their connections. The objects are some of the most uh, well-known from the period. Uh, a couple of poems from the Vercelli book, which is a late 10th, early 11th uh, century Anglo-Saxon manuscript. It's currently in Turin. Um, the Ruthwell Cross, which is from the 8th century, late 8th century. It's in uh, Northumbria. Oh, well, Anglo-Saxon Northumbria, but just across the border in Scotland, near Greading, actually very close to Lockerbie, uh, about a mile down the road from Lockerbie. Um, the Bewcastle Cross, which is just across the border on the other side of the border in, in England near Carlisle. Uh, the Brussels Cross, which is a late 10th, early 11th century altar cross. These are not to scale, so those other things are 17 feet tall. Uh, this is about that size. Um, it's gilt, and on the other side, uh, it's not gilt because somebody stripped it off. Um, these are interesting because they span the period, both geographically, linguistically, everything about them. The crosses in the north are Northumbrian, which is the ancestor of modern day Scottish, uh, lowland Scottish, like Glaswegian and things like that. Um, and they're from the early part of the century. The stuff at the bottom, uh, the Brussels cross and the Vercelli book are all very late, actually post-conquest probably in most cases, um, and are in the dialect that later became Southern English. Um, they're, they're really interesting for a variety of reasons. Uh, there's a complete runic poem there, which is, there's only one other example of that. They include one of only two to three other examples of actual quotation in the entire Anglo-Saxon cor uh, corpus. On one of the crosses, they quote another poem, and that's like one of, that's, that's you could argue is probably, that's, it's one of probably only two real obvious examples where somebody is saying, I am quoting somebody else uh, from the entire period. They contain uh, three copies of the same piece of text, which uh, less than 3% of the Anglo-Saxon poetic corpus shows up more than once from the time, and they're related to each other thematically and textually. So we anticipate this being a small data project, as well as a not so traditional <coughs> small data project, because we're editing a bunch of them together. And that is to say, we anticipate users will come to us because they're interested in these particular objects and our particular analysis. But we also think that they're a contribution to a big data project uh, purpose in that they could be reused by others. They could, you could do cross uh, work on archeological monuments. There's a number of European projects for that. Uh, you could supplement them, aggregate them, disagree with us. And in some cases, in fact, you actually um, have to because the work that we did for this is not something they're gonna let you do for a while. So in, in the case of the stone crosses, we had to scaffold them and getting the permission for that was pretty hard. And given how dangerous that is to sandstone monuments, you're not likely to be able to do that for the next you know, 20 or 30 years, probably. So our project requirements were that they had to be flexible, extensible, authoritative. Um, they had to 
we had to preserve credit and responsibility for our contributions, and they had to be durable. And this is something else I haven't actually mentioned. Another feature about humanities work, about it being uh, small, thick, and slow, is that slow part really is slow. So when I did my edition of Cadman's Hymn, the previous standard edition was 70 years old uh, when I finished it. And we're doing some work right now on how long do editions last, and it looks like a standard edition of a text in the humanities stays with the scholar their entire lives. What happens is you, uh, you get an edition when you're in graduate school, and then you work with that for the rest of your life, your life almost no matter what else happens, you will associate, if a new edition comes out and becomes important after that, you will cross-reference them, but people always use the edition that they got, and the timelines are also extremely, uh, just generally very long. The Beowulf editions, uh, for example, um, the current edition is a re-edit of the previous edition, which means it was done in 2007, but the edition that it's based on ultimately comes from like 1920. Uh, so these things go forever. And so in our case with the Ruthwell Cross, the previous edition of the Ruthwell Cross was from the 1970s, but it wasn't actually a new, completely new edition. So not only am I anticipating other people will use this work, if the timelines stay the same, they'll be using this work for a century, right? That's the kind of timeline that we're talking about. If your work is meant as humanities research rather than an experiment in digital humanities. So we tried different approaches over the years. Our very first approach was actually wiki-based. We thought uh, it would be kind of cool, so it's flexible. You know, we used category, we had a media wiki installation, we used categories and entries. You can add and reconnect and reuse stuff without negotiation, but it doesn't preserve authority. It requires ongoing maintenance. You have to keep your Wikimedia up to date. And there is one kind of presentation that is as part of Wikimedia, and you have to be in their world for that. We also tried game engines. That was a lot of fun. Not very effective, but a lot of fun. Um, it provided really interesting ways of organizing material, and games are really good at navigating 3D worlds, of course, and so it was pretty good for our process. There was a weird bit where we tried out with an audience. We could uh, the game engine we had. I don't remember what it was called anymore, but it was a first-person shooter game engine. And so the way you found out information on the Ruffalo Cross was you shot at it. And so we were trying to think of ways of you know not making it look like you were shooting. Um, some game engines allowed external contributions, so you could go in and out. That was nice for the flexibility. Um, but first of all, if you're in a game world, you have to use my game world. You can't use your own game world. Uh, so you've got to be in our system, it's not really flexible, wasn't really very strong and external, and again, somebody's got to maintain the game engine, and it's going to be you. We then discovered Open, if you don't know this, this is really cool, this is a project from uh, the Manuscript Library at the University of Pennsylvania, Specialist Collections. It's a repository for manuscript information and transcription. Uh, it's Will Knoll put it up, uh, he's the Special Collections Librarian there. He was previously at um, the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, and he's actually the guy behind the Ar Archimedes Palimpsest project. Um, so he put this up. He's really always been big at taking, when he was at the Walters, he took their entire collection and threw it out on Instagram. He's really big on getting stuff out. Um, and they had a turning the pages type interface for it when he took over, but he hated that because you couldn't download everything and reuse it. He wanted you to be able to scrape it. So what he did was, it's essentially a lightly skinned directory structure. Um, it's got human readable HTML pages that tell you stuff uh, so you can navigate and see what's there. Uh, they're based on XML files that are changed on the slot, the spot. Oh, sorry, I was missing some of, this, I'm missing some of the stuff there. So basically he had these uh, human readable pages. It's based basically just on a directory structure that's skinned and everything is coming out of XML that he's got there that's, that's being transformed on the spot and divided into different parts. Uh, so it's actually a fair bit of, of good information in there as well, and you can, RC, you can uh, SSH the whole thing down if you want. Uh, so it's very, very flexible. So we love this because it does everything that we wanted in, well, many things that we wanted. It's flexible, you can group them different ways if you want, uh, it just depends on how your XSLT or JSON is working. It's extensible, you can grab stuff from it, you can refer to stuff in it. It's authoritative, uh, he controls that directory structure, so everything there is his. Uh, there's no problem with somebody else you know, eliminating his material. 
and is durable, it really doesn't require any software maintenance. XS, XSLT and XML are not things that you have to update that often. And uh, you know, basically a Unix directory structure requires nothing. But it's not perfect. It's inflexible, so it's a hierarchical data structure. It really is just a data directory. Um, and so you can't weirdly have virtual collections on his machine. I could create a virtual collection somewhere, but it requires a bit of work. It's not extensible uh, in the sense that he's the only person who can reorganize it. And it's also not extensible in the sense that you need to be the official organ in order to have a space on his directory. So with manuscript libraries put all of their manuscripts there. So we felt a bit weird about this. We have one manuscript from the Cathedral Library in Turin. It felt a bit weird for us to say, well, we'll pretend we're the Cathedral Library of Turin. Could you put our manuscript there? That sounds pretty obviously like we're going to need their authority to do that, even though it's our research. Um, and it's actually ultimately not durable in the sense that even though it's a directory structure, so there's not a lot of maintenance, it's his directory server. It's his server. And so if he stops paying for the server, it stops. And he's a manuscript librarian, not a server uh, systems admin. And so it's always going to be secondary work. And there's also no persistent identifiers, which I find truly strange. So that raised two, three other requirements. We realized externally registered persistent identifiers. Uh, we need to be able to present alternatives inside or outside the system. And it has to be publish and forget in the sense that once I'm finished with it, I should never have to maintain this thing again. Because if I do, then all of a sudden we run into the maintenance problems and all of a sudden I'm doing work for your big data collection. And I'm just, I may do it because I'm a nice person, but other people aren't going to. So then what we did was we came up with a solution. We used Zenodo and GitHub. If you don't know, Zenodo uh, archives GitHub um, releases, which is really an incredibly powerful. Um, and so we use this to create an open like data repository, but we also think it answers some of the, the uh, lacunae there. It's human and machine readable, so that's great. Uh, it preserves attribution. Uh, it is, however, open to non-negotiated additions and reorganizations and reuse. I'm going to show that in a second. But anybody can add stuff to Zenodo, and anybody can link to our stuff in Zenodo, which means you can say, I think Dan's wrong, that isn't a model of the Rumble Cross, that's actually a model of the VCAS Cross. And Zenodo will let you do that. You still have access to me saying it is the Rumble Cross, but other people can get into my data and do stuff with it. It uses standard third-party maintained IDs, and this is, I think, probably the most important thing for getting humanities data into the big data record. It's maintained by people whose primary job is maintaining an archive. So they don't think of paying for the server as something they have to do alongside their real work. Their real work is making sure that our data stays there forever, which is what you really want. In case you don't know, Zenodo is uh, an EU-funded open-air data repository. It's hosted at CERN, the European Nuclear Lab. Uh, works off of the excess uh, computing power of the Large Hadron Collider, which causes some trouble, actually. Uh, it's guaranteed forever by the EU. It used to be guaranteed for the life of CERN plus 20 years, but after fixed share guaranteed their deposits forever, uh, CERN has now guaranteed, they've got the same arrangement that if CERN goes under, it'll go to, I believe, a consortium with universities. Uh, it accepts all research outputs from all fields of science. It assigns DOIs to all submissions, and it has a really cool thing here called conceptual DOIs and record DOIs. You may have seen that on the first slide I had this. This version, this slideshow has two DOIs. It's got the DOI for this particular version, and then it's got a DOI that's the conceptual DOI that points to the latest version, no matter how many I put up. That's actually a really important thing if you're going to be doing multiple people working on the same data point. It's based on the Invenio Digital Repository Engine, and that's got excellent meta metadata and linked open data capabilities. If you're used to Figshare, uh, all of the repositories have roughly the same feature set, although I'm going to talk about that in a second too, briefly. Um, but one of the things this does that Figshare doesn't do, for example, is both of them allow to say, here's a related identifier of some kind. Zenodo allows you to type it. It allows you to say, this is another representation of this. This is a part of that. This is a previous version of that. Whereas Figshare only allows you to say these are related in some way. 
So you can use uh, semantic web technologies on links created in Zenodo. GitHub, I'm sure everybody knows what that is, but it's a code repository. Uh, it has version control distribution system. It has something called GitHub Pages now, which is a Jekyll server, very lightweight web server. So basically, they are providing free web service uh, for you. It's used by millions for developing code-based projects. Uh, you can publish via go, um, GitHub Pages. It has a couple of problems. It's not archival quality. It's owned by Microsoft. That's not why it's not archival po po policy, but it's owned by a private company, although it always has been a private company. Um, but it's not archival because the conditions allow them to shut it down at any moment. Fortunately, though, you can uh, deposit each release in Zenodo, which is then your directory stack is uh, essentially in Zenodo. So where that is shut GitHub down, GitHub down tomorrow, first of all, that would last about 10 minutes since everything in the world would stop in terms of <laughs> software development. But if they were to do it and get away with it, um, all you got to do is take your directory, your server stack from Zenodo and put it on a different server and everything will work right away. So they interact amazingly. GitHub's non-guarantee is basically replaced by Zenodo's permanent guarantee. And presentation, all versions, including your code base, is a fair, citable object. We tried this out on my edition of Cab and Tim, which was originally a CD-ROM from 2005. It's now available online. You can get it at cadman.cnet.org or at cnetmedievalgithub.io slash cadmanshim. The reason why I gave you both is because that top URL is maintained by CNET, my press, but it's a very shoestring thing. They could go under tomorrow. This other one is maintained by GitHub. So even if CNET were to vanish tomorrow, it's still available from two URLs. And then if GitHub were to go, then I could always take that stack and put it back up there. So I published and forgot this thing, basically. And its code base is preserved in Zenodo as a Zenodo object with its own DOI. Weirdly, CNET doesn't give DOIs to its publication. So the title page here, you can't see it, but it says here that it's got all the, you know, where it was published, its editions, and then it's got down here a DOI for the code, but not a DOI for the actual object because there isn't a DOI for the human readable version of this. And here you can see it. So here's the code base, the GitHub code base, that's what you're seeing when you go to the edition. It's also available in Zenodo. It's got a DOI. It's got what else it's related to. And it also has a complete version history of everything that we've released. So, and I don't have to maintain any of this. So how would you do it with the Visionary Cross? Well, you combine those two systems and then you end up with something that answered all of our projects with one caveat that I'm going to get to. Uh, so the heart of this, oh, I should say, actually, there's more than one caveat. The caveats show up anytime there's an asterisk. You should ask me about that, because <laughs> there's the caveats. There's basically one record. Uh, one record is one piece of data uh, that, at the heart of the Zenodo record. So basically what you have to do is you take your edition and you explode it into a series of Zenodo records. Uh, so every piece of data gets its own Zenodo record. It provides machine readability, but also extensibility, persistence, and archiving. But it also acts as a document server for the rest of the edition. This has an asterisk beside it because it actually doesn't quite do that right now. That's one of the things uh, Zenodo is doing for us. Figshare <coughs> does, though. We have a hack where we duplicate everything in Figshare and Zenodo, and then we stream out of Figshare. Uh, a Zenodo record is human and machine readable. Uh, it has those typed additional, uh, it has these typed additional relationships, so you can say, you know, there's, this is documented by this, this is a, an instance of that. It has those double DOIs, conceptual and record, which means I can build my edition as I go using the conceptual DOI always, which means even as I replace data, I'm always pulling the latest version in. Again, this publishing and forgetting. And it uses RESTful file URLs, um, or actually I should say it did until mid-July, uh, which is file IDs have the DOI number as part of them, and the same behavior used to work with files. If you took the conceptual DOI and you put it in the file uh, URL, you always went to the latest version. 
if you took the instance DOI number and put it in the URL, you went to that specific version. They broke that in July uh, because they didn't realize they were doing it. Um, and so one of our projects is for them to get that working again. So here's all the versions, and there's the payload with, I've got the thing over here, but this is the file reference. When you see it, you, you can't, but it's got the DOI there. So the way this works is you bust the thing up over Zenodo, um, and basically, I'm gonna, not gonna go into this detail, but basically I've got my 3D representation and maybe an XML description. Each of these are separate Zenodo records because I'm assigning a DOI to everything so that I can access any one part of this and others can as well. So I've got my real world object, I've got a metadata description as, a, as an object in Zenodo. That has dependencies, it's got a 3D object, an XML description. Uh, they're all linked together so a machine knows that they belong together. Remember one of our problems is we have all this incredibly curated data but we can't connect the thick description to the data for large data projects. Um, I've got some other object over here that I say is related, same thing, I have a metadata description, I say this is related to that using the DOIs, same kind of stuff, multiple 3D representations, whatever. And then in GitHub Pages I build my website and all the data comes from Zenodo instead. And so as a result, they're supplying my material, I built my website in a system where they're going to maintain it and the references are all to the stuff that's being permanently maintained by the EU. So I, this just shows you this. I'm going to skip through this for a second because I want to show you. Here's the final version of, this is the final version. I've got a GitHub pages, which is where you go as a human, but all that data is coming off of these Zenodo records and everything has a DOI. So I can refer to each stage of this and more importantly, you can. More importantly, you can. So if you disagree with me, you can come and essentially hijack my data for your work. Now, you're not hijacking it because my edition still exists, but these, direct, these links are essentially bidirectional. So you can come along and say, well, you know what? I actually have a different object that's related to this thing. And by putting in the DOIs, all of a sudden you're now part of my edition as well. And so you've got the data, but you also have that thick description is connected to it. You can add your own description. You can say it supplements or contradicts the other thing, and Zenodo will allow you to type it. Uh, you can add new readings, whatever you want with that. And so the result of this is that, on the one hand, we're creating a way of taking all that thick, small, thick, and slow humanities data, and we're keeping all of that, that intense curation, the detailed information about it, we're making it accessible to you. You can build a collection of stone crosses if you want that's being put into Zenodo, but you're never losing the fact that somebody has written some massive scholarly commentary about it. Or you're, so you're building this sort of way of getting big data at the small data, but more importantly from my perspective, you've just given me a free publishing system where Everything is maintained by people whose job it is to maintain those bits and pieces. So the advantages, like OPEN, is human readable. Uh, it improves though, it's got persistent IDs, it's fair, it's not restricted to hierarchical arrangements, it can be exported all over the place. You don't even have, if you don't like Zenodo, it doesn't matter. You can refer to Zenodo uh, from outside the system. If you don't like GitHub, you don't have to use GitHub. It exists on its own. That you could decide you work entirely in Figshare, that's fine too, because Figshare can read Zenodo DOIs, everybody can read DOIs. Uh, you can export the stuff to any standard, there's no restriction on what you can download from Zenodo unless somebody's uh, embargoed something. You can rearrange it, you can add to it, you can do whatever you want, and it's maintained forever by people who specialize in that. And so the result is that you've got a big data project that supports small, thick, and slow publication in a fair format. So the disadvantages uh, are it's accidental. If you look at institutional repositories or repository systems, these features are all available, but they're unevenly distributed across them. Uh, Figshare allows streaming, but it doesn't do typed uh, relationships. Zenodo does typed relationships, but it doesn't do streaming. Uh, Zenodo does allow arbitrary ontologies for one project, but for nobody else. Uh, and it had this cool file system that it broke because it didn't realize it was doing it. Uh, Zenodo was also not sure about how conceptual versus record DOIs work. 
uh, if you ask them, they sort of say, well, we're experimenting with it. We're not sure it does, it's supposed to work this way. It had a RESTful DOI-based API. Now it only has that for uh, record-based DOIs. It doesn't have it for conceptual DOIs anymore. So what you're actually seeing there is the institutional repositories have been built with that STEM big data stuff in mind, and they accidentally supported the slow, thick, and small humanities data. But it's not that they can't support it, it's just they haven't seen the use case until very, very recently, until about three months ago when we called them up and said, hey, you're breaking our system. And so while the, humanity, the ability to support it's there, it's not being done consciously and mindfully. It is something that can be accommodated, though, with almost, essentially, very little work anyway. So the next steps are we're doing that. Uh, we've just put in for 200,000 Canadian, uh, which isn't quite enough to get everything done, but it's enough to get the big things done. We're building the prototype in Zenodo with GitHub. Um, we've agreed with CERN that if we get the money, uh, they will formalize and commit to the required features. Uh, the arbitrary ontologies is the only one that we can't afford right now. Um, and we're going to develop a couple of features that are not found there, like the streaming, uh, particularly, and the ultimately the arbitrary uh, ontologies. And then we're going to test it out on existing publications and data. We've got a bunch of projects with legacy data that we're going to try and uh, get out there. Um, and then ultimately, and that's the other thing, this is not a closed system. We're using Zenodo just because it has most of this stuff, but we could have used Figshare, we could have used DSpace, it really doesn't matter. Um, and as I say, we just put it together and the goal is to start prototyping next year.